Well, welcome everyone to our fourth BT List Live webinar. I am very pleased to welcome our esteemed guests. We have with us Marlon Wynette, who is a global translation advisor with um, the United Bible Societies. We have with us uh, Michelle Camonia, Executive Director of SIL International. And we have Brian Harmelink, who is the Director for Collaboration for the Wycliffe Global Alliance. Gentlemen, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here with us. As I say at the start of these webinars, I have so many questions. As I try to serve the Lord and work as a translation consultant in the 21st century, in a country where I was not born, helping in languages that I didn't grow up speaking, I, so many questions come to my mind. So I need your help. Um, gentlemen, I've got here with me the Translator's Field Guide, published in 1970 in Ukurumpa by SIL, uh, at that time, Summer Institute of Linguistics. In the preface to this, and you'll see here, can you see the name that is inscribed on the first page? John Waters. Um, in the preface, you know, working as a Bible translation practitioner, I thought this is exactly the sort of thing I need to read to jump into Bible translation. And so here's what I read in the preface. First and foremost, this book is oriented to the specific needs of the members of the Summer Institute of Linguistics. When they settle in a village or hamlet to commence their field work, their prime responsibility is to achieve conversational fluency in the vernacular as rapidly and fully as possible, and to gain an understanding of the ways and thoughts of the people among whom they live. Later on, the emphasis of their fieldwork shifts to research into the phonology and grammar of the language they are learning. And eventually, their energies are devoted to applying all they have learned in translating the Bible and other materials into the vernacular. Clearly, language learning is the first task of the would-be translator, and it is the primary emphasis of this guide. Gentlemen, this was published 50 years ago, so I would like you to help us think through if we had to publish a new edition, if, if, um, if we're going to publish a new edition, what would you write? Let's start with, um, with Michelle first. What would you gentlemen write in a preface to Bible translation in the 21st century? I think that's a, that's a, that's a very uh, interesting question. And uh, uh, it seems to me when you read what uh, is uh, contained in that uh, preface of the 1977 edition of the Field Guide to Bible Translation, we can understand that uh, it all had to do with the context in which Bible we have a is that me or Michelle? That's Michelle. Are we losing Michelle? Michelle is. Uh, oh no! Freezing. Oh no! We're losing Michelle. You you froze on us, Michelle. Yeah, I don't know. Really, know what to do here. Maybe. Um, just give me this. All right, let's continue. Let's, uh, Marlon, can I ask you to go next and then we'll come back to Michelle. Um, hopefully his connection will have stabilized by then. Marlon, what would you write in a preface to, uh, to a Bible translation practitioner's guide for the 21st century? Yes, well, I, um, good morning, everybody. Good morning from my side. Um, no, I need to say that, of course, um, coming from another organizational framework where United Bible Societies where um, the framework has always been where um, consultants um, help translation teams who are in place. So the emphasis um, would be on linguistics, general linguistics in the sense of getting to know the language group, but not so much as language learning as, as used to be the case um, with SIL. So for me, the field guide is, is a, I, I don't know it very well. Um, I, I would say um, one of the things that I would emphasize in our days anyway, is um, the importance of um, translation work to be bi-directional in the sense that um, we will come in to assist teams 
um, we come in with different roles to assist a team of translators, recognizing their talents and allowing them also a platform to speak back to the translation community worldwide. Mm -hmm. I would emphasize words like emancipation, um, the importance for, for the local translation team um, to recognize their own talents and to grow in their own, their own talents, develop their own capacity. I would talk about local capacity building, um, where I think that there's not one grid for the cooperation between a local team and an external organization, an external consultant. It very much depends on the team situation. It very much depends on the team's capabilities and its growth. So I, I would very much emphasize a flexible grid where um, we are assisting teams to translate the word of God. Um, we are being helped by them to understand something of the Bible that we didn't know because of the way they look at the Bible. And we are offering a certain expertise to them so that they can grow as a, as a, as a community of faith in that knowledge of the Bible and the scripture access. No, that sounds great. Um, let's go to you, Brian, if we can. Um, what, would you, what would you write in a preface or what would you see as the prime responsibility of a Bible translation practitioner? Or how do you see translation in the 21st century? Well, I think first of all, um, what Michelle started saying is context is, is the key factor. And uh, we need to understand that, um, and I appreciate someone put in the chat that Alan Healy um, just died, um, was it 91 years of age uh, last month in Australia. Oh. And so, um, you know, colleagues like him have made great contributions in various contexts over the decades. And so uh, we want to recognize what contexts have been in the past and changing contexts that we're working in today. And so uh, one of the first things I would want to do is identify which practitioners we um, would be writing to. And so uh, for me, especially now in the 21st century, if we're talking about translators, the primary decision maker in a translation, uh, from my perspective, is are the speakers of that language, the local translator team. And so if, um, if I were writing uh, a, a manual for local translators, uh, one of the first things I would want to emphasize is their calling into participating in the mission of God through Bible translation. Um, is an awesome thing and that they have incredible abilities in the language they speak or the languages they speak and use and uh, the focus of the manual will be on how can their abilities, how can their capacities be enhanced to increase their skill in, in translation. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think um, translator training is, for me, one of the highest priorities of uh, this current period of time that we're uh, working in the Bible translation movement. Thank you. Michelle, can we go to you now? Yes, thank you. And I just want to thank Marlon and Brian for picking up what I meant to say and they saying it's far better than I could have said it. Uh, but the only thing I would add to uh, the bi-directionality concept that Marlon uh, brought and also just what I had begun saying, talking about the context, which is key and which determines all that we get to do. Uh, I just want to add to what Brian just mentioned, the fact that uh, in, in, in 50 years ago, a century ago, in many contexts where we went for Bible translation, we were dealing with, at times, with, with communities where there was no church presence as such, where there was no expression of the church. And I would say that a, a preface being written today to a Bible practitioner should highlight the necessity to take into account 
the presence or, or the, of the expressions of the church in the context in which they get to work because Bible translation is by nature an ecclesial activity and it has to be done with and within the context of the church. Yes, excellent, excellent. Well, we've, we've spoken about Bible translation in the 21st century, and we certainly wouldn't be where we are today if it weren't for the many Bible translation practitioners who've come before us, are um, the forerunners in the field. And um, over the years, SIL at least has been the target for a number, number of critiques um, things uh, accusing SIL of imperialism and colonialism in the context of the 21st, uh, in the context of the 20th century, excuse me. So, gentlemen, I just want us to be frank. Before we move decidedly into the 21st century, what are some sins of Bible translation practitioners in the 20th century that we need to repent of, that we need to own, and we need to ask forgiveness of before we move in? But we can't just sweep it under the rug. What do we need to own up to? Um, and to answer this first, can, can we go to you, Michelle? Uh, well, it's, uh, again, this is a very interesting question. Uh, the sins, you know, it's always very, very easy to point to the sins of others. But as they say in my language, when you point to one finger to somebody, there are at least three other fingers that are pointing back at you. So uh, uh, it's, this is to say that, um, it's, it's not an easy question that you're asking us to, to ki kind of uh, state the sins of others because someday some people will be sitting here also, I mean, looking at the sins that we are committing today. So that is, that is just one reality of history. Secondly, as I mentioned before, the context is always very critical in whatever we get to do. So even as we talk of sins, we should not be thinking in terms of uh, as if people had deliberately gone out just to do to harm other people, I think that is that would be that would not be the right perspective. I think we should be thinking of some of the things that could have been done with the best intentions, but that turned out to uh, to to have downsides or to to play inadvertently in ways that were not anticipated by the by the people themselves. That's how I would look at it when talking of sin. So. Uh, I think one of the things that I could mention, and let me just mention three things. I'm sure that Brian, who has been around longer than me, and Marlon would maybe know more since. Uh, let me point, uh, first of all, something like uh, the, the paternalism, which has been, which the, we have the missionaries and Bible translators have been criticized about. When, we, when I read the stories of Bible translation, even in my own country, Cameroon, I would read something like, Alfred Saker translated the Bible into the Douala language. That's a very huge statement. When we know the nature of Bible translation as something which necessarily involves a body of people, but just attributing it to one person, of course, it may be the, the, the vision bearer and so on, but I think that is quite much. And that also simply speaks to the fact that often our predecessors just drove the whole process and they were the main decision makers and there was not enough room for interaction with the various participants in the translation process. That would be the one thing that I would just call in the one concept of paternalism, which may have characterized our forerunners. The second thing I would point to, uh, allow me to be using RP words here, would be pragmatism. I think pragmatism has been one of the issues, uh, especially as people moved uh, out to the field, out of the uh, Edinburgh 1910 conference, really with a strong determination to, to, to see the whole world evangelized in this generation, meaning their generation. I always wonder why they never did it so that we would not be uh, dealing with all of these issues here today. But anyway, uh, it seems to me that pragmatic strategies really seem to have driven how our foreigners went into Bible translation. And with those pragmatic, strat pragmatic strategies, people emphasize social sciences and all kinds of things. Whatever was efficient and worked was, was, was highly upheld. And at times, people could inadvertently downplay the role of the theological and biblical foundation to what we get to do. 
And this is one of the things that I would say we need to be careful and watchful over as we continue to the, into the Bible translation movement. That's my second P. And the last one would be what I would call uh, extreme professionalization of Bible translation, whereby we have, we have framed Bible translation in ways that are so complex, so, um, so complex that the ordinary person or even the ordinary church person just feels that it is some, something for a few elect, so for a few elect, it is almost a mystery. And it seems to me that uh, uh, placing Bible translation in this way has inadvertently uh, drawn out, I mean, pushed away from the field of translation, even theologians and many, many people who could have played key roles in translation. So that extreme professionalization of Bible translation would be another thing that we want to watch over. So three things, pragmatism, uh, um, paternalism, and professionalization. These would be some of the things we would have to watch over because they have downsides that could inadvert inadvertently uh, not be helpful. Thank you. And uh, what do you say to that, Brian? Or what, what are your thoughts on this question? Well, I don't have uh, uh, an alliterated uh, response prepared, um, but my uh, comments uh, to Michelle's very good uh, three points uh, would be yes. Um, all of those things. And, and again, I want to go back to that word context. And so, uh, and I think in the, on this topic, just to realize that um, just as Michelle began, it is so easy to point the finger and identify the um, shortcomings of others. But at the same time, I want to say we, um, need to resist the tendency to be so quick to assign guilt or sins to others. They were, I think, many of our predecessors in the Bible translation movement in every era, every decade. Um, most were doing the best that they knew the best that they knew based on the training that they received. They were working in their context with very good intentions. And sometimes it's, um, I think as Michelle also pointed out, these unintended consequences that later come back to uh, haunt us. And we see in the, in retrospect, we see the um, I don't think it's too strong a word to say the collusion of certain missionary enterprises with colonialism. Um, and perhaps the individuals who were going as uh, missionaries in, that great, in those great movements had the purest of motives and the, uh, they did not see themselves as part of that um, government or colonial enterprise and then to realize that we ourselves are going to be the subject of future history books written about translation um, and all we can hope is that others will um, treat us kindly and realize that we too are working in our context and uh, trying to respond to the, uh, the call to participate in God's mission to the best of our uh, ability to discern what God is doing in, in the world in the 21st century. Marlon, are you, are you satisfied with what you're hearing so far, Marlon? Your microphone. Oh, you're Yes, I, I really concur with my colleagues. Um, I think it's good to look at the past and to draw lessons from it. I mean, we all stand on the shoulders of giants so that we can see the promised land. And the people upon whose shoulder we, we, we do stand, I mean, they will have committed mistakes and we commit mistakes. And it's also part of the whole contemporaneous situation in the world and the way the church sees itself. 
Um, one of the things that I think I, I really loved um, what Michelle, um, Michelle's three, <laughs> three points there, I really love them because I think it kind of covers. Um, so I, I wouldn't speak about, when I, when I saw the questions, I felt a little bit um, <laughs> awkward with it because I, I wouldn't speak about the sins so much. I, I would say, um, yes, I mean, it's good on one hand to recognize our sins and, 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 and to deal with them. But, but I think that more than, more than ever, we need to look back and try not to repeat um, the same mistakes and learn from, from those mistakes and learn. I, I think one of the great things of the past was the great missionary zeal. And I think the missionary zeal, so when you, when you think about Bible translation as part of the Great Commission, and, and you think about it that way, which is, which is good, but if you only concentrate on that individual um, salvation, then Bible translation becomes only a tool for individual salvation. What often was forgotten was the Bible translation also leads to cultural transformation and to cultural mm -hmm. impact. And in weighing those, those, two, those two very good uh, things that we want to accomplish with Bible translation, I think maybe in the past, the aspect of missionary zeal towards the individual sometimes trumped the whole aspect of cultural participation and how Bible translation impacts a whole culture. But, but I wouldn't call it sense. I would say um, we learn from the past and, and, and they're learning from it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yes. Thank you. Okay. We're going we're gonna to change gears a little bit. That, that subject may have been a little bit heavy. And seeing as none of you were willing to throw the first stone, we're going to move on to some later <laughs> questions. Um, Brian, tell me, as a translation consultant, I want to avoid, I want to be culturally appropriate. I want to serve the best way possible according to the gifts the Lord has given me. And help me what would be the worst possible sin or what would be the worst possible mistake a translation consultant could make in your opinion? Well, maybe this is going to sound very mild, um, but um, I was thinking earlier uh, when you were giving the, um, uh, for making your first comments, Drew, you talked about how many questions you have. And I would say one of the worst um, things that a consultant can do is to stop having questions, uh, to stop being a learner. Um, and that goes along with the, the consultancy process of uh, kind of the other side of that is the willingness to say, I don't know uh, when questions come. And so that uh, having questions and wanting to learn and being willing to uh, say that you don't know um, an answer to something that maybe uh, others think you should know. Um, why haven't you translated that or haven't you worked on that verse before? Haven't you been a part of, why don't you know that? And so the, uh, the to use your phrase, the worst sin or mistake would be to act as if you know everything and can answer every question. Uh, so it's a, a humility of a uh, consultant is one of the most important things. Okay, yes, thank you. Um, on the lighter side again, Martha, would you just tell us briefly about what's your earliest memory of interacting with the Bible? Your microphone, microphone. I was forgetting my microphone. Yes, um, no, my earliest memory is just going to a traditional church and hearing the gospel read out during mass. And then my earliest memory of actually reading a passage myself is when um, it's an old translation in Papiamento New Testament done in Aruba, which I found at home somewhere. And I, I think I might have been 10 or 11 they started to reading in it so those are my memories i think i think my 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 earliest memories are of the gospel um the gospel and, and the person of jesus i would say yeah. yeah interesting uh michelle tell us again on the lighter side of things who from antiquity would you most like to sit down with for a chat if you could pick anyone 
Well, I think from the antiquity, there are so many prominent people that we all admire today. Um, but one that would be fascinating to me would be somebody who really looked a bit much like uh, what would have been uh, a, a wise person within my own village. Uh, that would be Socrates. Uh, who was somebody who did not leave any big any writings as such, but who influenced so many people just through the way he could lead the people to think and to discover knowledge just by asking questions. And that, that oral approach to help people think deeply is something that I've always ad admired in Socrates' maiotics. Okay. Good, thank you. All right, we're gonna get a little bit heavy again. Let's move back into the 21st century. Brian, um, I like reading about translation theory. Um, in your opinion, what are some of the best or what is perhaps the best theoretical approach to translation? Um, to that, what is the best theoretical approach to translation that will serve uh, Bible translation practitioners best in the 21st century? Sorry, yeah, I got a notice saying my internet connection cut out. That's why I kind of repeated myself. But go ahead, Brian. I think you kind of grasped my question with all my mumbling. Yes, and I, I think um, my response would be there is no one single theoretical approach that will best serve um, us move, serve not only us, but the everyone involved in the global Bible translation movements. Um, and I think that's, um, you know, one of the perspectives that I would hope to, um, to just keep emphasizing that we, and even though we have um, what the Zoom says, 122 participants here, uh, we're such a small fraction of, of the whole Bible translation movement. And so, um, you know, there might be things that are of theoretical interest to me, but are they really of um, practical use to um, others working um, in, in various places around the world? And so I think the best theoretical approach we can uh, try to have as um, the practitioners or theorists or consultants or whatever our role is in translation is uh, the approach that will allow us to um, engage with and um, again, as just as Michelle was bringing out, um, bring out the knowledge and ability of the everyone involved in the process. And so I think there are many um, theoretical approaches that have served us well. Um, and that's another thing, I'll go back again to the word context. Uh, these theoretical approaches keep changing and we need to constantly be keeping up to date with what is happening in uh, various um, fields of translation studies. Uh, that's, I think, been one of, that would be one of the uh, recommendations I would have to all of us that there's a whole world of reflection on and um, thinking about translation that uh, for many years, for many decades, the Bible translation community has really not engaged with uh, the world of translation studies of those uh, working um, in professional translation and literary translation and legal translation, uh, so much that we uh, can learn from them. So I think the th approach I would say is an eclectic one that allows us to um, work with others without imposing a certain uh, theoretical paradigm on them. Uh, and so uh, an approach that allows us to um, engage with, and if I were to identify perhaps something within pedagogy, it might be uh, thinking more about um, 
student-centered uh, pedagogical methods and what would it like to develop a translator-centered uh, approach to our uh, consultancy processes. Uh, so um, whenever I'm asked uh, to identify one thing or what my favorite this or that is, my typical response is, I hate those kinds of questions because it's so hard to identify one. Um, so I think- I'm well, having a good time, Brian. Um, that we need this multiple, multidisciplinary, eclectic approach yeah. um, because every context is different and um, some approaches will work well in some contexts and, and maybe not in others. I really appreciate that response. Thank you. Um, let's go to Marlon next on this question about theoretical approaches and how to approach translation in the 21st century. Um, the same question. Yes, please. Um, <laughs> yes, no, I, I, I don't want to make it long because I think exactly as Brian. I, okay. I, I don't think, I think the benefit of more functionalist approaches is that you kind of take very much into account the audience, the particular context, and the desire of the people, and different contexts, different people. So I, I, I would just want to concur with Brian on this. And, I don't have anything more to add, I would say. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you, Marlon. And yes. if um, any of our interested attendees wanted to learn more about a functionalist approach to translation, who are some thought leaders or who would you recommend reading or looking to um, for more information on a functionalist approach? Yes, you could read uh, Rice and Vermeer or Christiana Nord has done some good work on that. Um, on our, on MAP, um, the modular aggregate <laughs> manual that we have on the internet for consultants and translators. There's a lot of material, a lot of uh, bibliography there on the functionalist approach. A lot of articles have been written how to apply it. So we think about scope of theory as, as maybe the most well-known functionalist approach. Um, I, I think Christiana North, I think does a good job in another setting of explaining what this is about and then how do we apply it in our own situation. It's a different okay. thing, of course. Yes, excellent. And I know that that's one of the updates that uh, Katie Barnwell made to the latest edition, her fourth edition of her Bible translation manual was incorporating some of the insights from Scopus theory and functionalist approaches. So I think, um, yes, that sounds excellent. Michelle, do you have anything to, um, to say on this? Anything to uh, add? Not, not really. Uh, I, I think uh, Bran and Marlon has, have uh, done a good job of uh, picking what I could have talked about. Uh, I just want to emphasize words that you've heard are re really approaching translation from a learner's perspective, not with a one size fits all approach uh, or yep. perspective that we want to impose wherever yep. we go, but really approaching as a learner, having an <clears throat> perspective, which means that we, we, we embrace a vast uh, array of theoretical perspective and seek to find out in which com in each context what is the approach that best suits this context? And uh, I think, um, yeah, my predecessors have uh, really uh, given good perspectives on how to approach uh, this question in the 21st century. Thank you. Okay. No, that's good. Yes, so speaking of context and speaking of Bible translation practitioners, Marlon, I want to ask you now to talk to us a little bit about your philosophy of consulting. How do you approach it? I was doing some reading in my meditation time on the history of Bible translation in Suriname. And um, I came across this, um, and I quote from the book, there's a book by uh, Franklin Stephen Jabini, Bible Translation in Suriname, an overview of its history, translators, and sources, published in 2015. Um, and I found this quote, in 2001, SIL and SBG, which is the Suriname Bible Society, further agreed that the Suriname Bible Society would publish the Sarantongo translation by the SIL team and checked by Dr. Marlon Wynette, a translation consultant of the United Bible Societies. In 2002, Wynette approved the translation. On October 10th, uh, 2002, the new translation of the New Testament was dedicated at the uh, Grotestadskirk of the Moravian Church in Paramaribo, 
uh, Dyra, the general secretary of the Bible Society at that time, chose this church because this was the church in which the first New Testament of 1829 was dedicated. It was also the same church in which the former African enslaved people went to thank God at the abolition of slavery in 1863. Now, the part I wanted to emphasize, now that is all very interesting, a fascinating insight into the way the Bible was received and dedicated and um, just fascinating. Uh, but the part I want to hone in on is the quote, in 2002, Wynette approved the translation. And I'm just wondering if that's how you view your role. Um, if so, okay. If not, how would you talk about your role in that project or in general, your approach to consulting? Yes, this, this question can either be seen as a curveball or it can be seen as a nice ball right in the middle of the plate for me to hit. <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. Um, yes, um, so the person who wrote this um, emphasizes the word approve. I, I must say, I come to the translation world as a translator first. So I used to be one of the translators. I was one translator of the Mintu Bible. And I had my first consultant, my consultant who worked with me, um, United Bible Society Consultant, Case de Blois, very well known figure. Um, his approach to our team kind of led me in the way I approach consultancy. So his approach was, okay, what does this team have? Um, what are they good in? Um, in terms of linguistics, in terms of exegesis, in terms of translation, conversion, all that kind of stuff. And then he would only help the team insofar as the team needed help. <laughs> and as far as the team wanted help and would ask for help in particular areas. Um, so that has been my approach. Um, this, this terminology of, of approving, um, people who know me know that for years now I've been protesting against this terminology. Um, normally when I write my own document, there's a document that decision consultants need to write. And the term approval comes from the whole organizational setting with donors and Bible agencies where some accountability, I, I think more than anything, I see it as an accountability moment where people from the outside want a mediator to say, I've worked with this team. And normally I say, well, you know, like what I write literally in my, in my approval <laughs> statement is that the team, the team and I <laughs> have come to the conclusion that um, we have done everything we can <laughs> to have this translation be at a place where it's publishable. <laughs> uh, um, the team, the team uh, thinks they are followed. And, and I think a lot of times as a decision consultant, our task is to work with the team in establishing their parameters, what they would like to see, their, their brief. And in those days, you wouldn't talk about translation brief, but it was still the same thing, I would say. And then what we are doing often is to help the team, remind the team, to be kind of a reminder that remember that you, you, you guys said you wanted to do it this, this, you, you took this decision. So remember you took this decision in Galatians. So maybe you want to take it again or are you changing your mind? So I guess we are more. So my, my, my philosophy is more, I, I have a little bit of a struggle with defining the role of a translation consultant because I've always said that the translation consultant becomes what the team demands of the consultant. So, so the social consultant who comes into a team where there's a lot of need for linguistic analysis of their own language, where they need to be given tools. So sometimes I see the consultant as a resource person, just providing tools to the team so they can work with. Sometimes the consultant is a negotiator because there are so many stakeholders, different churches, who are not used to working together, and it helps to have an outsider come in and help to become a bridge. Um, very often the decision consultant is also the team looks to the consultant to give some background information about the Hebrew or the Greek of them. So I would say a chameleon, the transition consultant is a servant who tries to adapt as much as possible to the needs of the team. So going into a work with a team, I think a consultant has certain responsibilities towards the agency. There are certain, certain um, 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 processes and procedures that are set, but the work itself in the field will adapt itself, depending on the, Brian mentioned the word context <laughs> a couple of times, depending now on the context of the translation team. And, and the same consultant, the same consultant will work in different way 
with different teams. One time somebody asked me, how come you work as a consultant with three different translations in Suriname? And they each had a different translation choice for a particular verse. And they said, if you work with them, how come they have each one? I said, because the three are valid. And it's the team who ultimately makes the decision. I'm just providing them the information that in this case, you can interpret it A, B, or C. And each team, after explaining to them, they made another choice. So it's not the consulting imposing on the team, it's helping the team to understand the text. And as I like what Brian said, I think uh, um, Michelle said it too, it's the team is at the center. I think the consultant comes in to help, to assist, and I, I want to come back later on the bi-directionality bidirect because that's very important to me. I think in the past, we have forgotten that we need to channel the voices of the translation teams to the wider translation and church community. But, yeah. Okay, Michael, Brian, do you guys have anything to add to that? No. <laughs> Feel free to disagree. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, how about you? <laughs> no, I'll, 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 I'm not going to disagree. I'll, um, I'll con I concur with what, what Marlon has said, and I, I think um, just to reiterate a couple things I've said, I think we've, um, we've focused so much on this consultant uh, role especially in recent decades, as if uh, the consultant is the key to uh, progress in the Bible translation movement, when actually the consultant is just one of many parts of the process. And yes, consultants play an important role. And um, I might push back a little bit on the chameleon because of <laughs> um, some of the potentially um, negative connotations no, that the chameleon yeah, might have. Yeah. But, Very um, tongue in cheek, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, and so the, yes, we need to work differently with, in different contexts with different teams and uh, focus on the strengths that they already have and not see this consultancy role as uh, we're the experts going in to make sure that everything is done right. Um, we're part of the process. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons earlier I said that I think translator training is so key mm -hmm. is because um, stronger translation teams will help reduce the interventions needed from consultants and the whole movement can uh, move forward um, in a stronger way with uh, a, a broader um, strength in training and ability across all the roles involved. Mm. Okay. Good. Okay. Um, well, gentlemen, some have described Bible translation as a site of multiple tensions be between stakeholders. Uh, tensions between stakeholders, whether they be funders, donors, those who are in positions of authority, positions of authority either ascribed to them or positions that they position themselves in. So as a consultant, Marlon, you could say, hey, I'm here to serve you. But ultimately, you're the one with the doctorate sitting across the table with all the knowledge, the experience, and the title. So whether you take that upon yourself or not, you're still, you still in some cases might be ascribed a certain level of authority that you might not be comfortable with yourself. So we find that there is oftentimes this tension. Um, and even within Bible translation itself, even in the day-to-day -day of a consultant, we find that there can be tensions that are brought about by this... Um, by multiple stakeholders. And I recall once working with a team who had been uh, trained kind of with different methods, methods different than I was used to. And um, it was the book of Ruth and we were going through the book of Ruth and here they had left out a verse in Ruth. And they said, well, according to the methods that we were trained by, 
um, this verse, we didn't think it was necessary. Um, in our language, for the natural of our language, we didn't think the content of this verse was necessary. So we just, we just left it out of our, of our translation. Now, as a new consultant, I, at first, I wasn't really sure how to navigate this tension. Do I, as a consultant, step in and insist that you've got to put this in, whatever? Um, but I began asking questions to understand where they were coming from and try to understand their context and everything. Um, but Brian, in situations like this, where we're trying to partner across organizations, given that Bible translation is the site of multiple tensions, can something like FOBI help us navigate and negotiate these tensions? Well, I'm, I'm glad um, you had prepared us ahead of time with uh, these questions. Um, so I, I knew this one was coming. Uh, would have been perhaps difficult to answer right now on the spot. Um, so um, as I thought about how I would answer this, um, I think the most important thing is to understand uh, the purpose and uh, vision of FOBI. And FOBI, the Forum of Bible Agencies International, for, uh, to, for those who may not be familiar with the acronym, um, is, is not a governing body that um, has, um, it is like the custodian of the uh, consultant qualifications document and the statement on basic uh, principles and procedures for translation, but FOBI is not itself an organization that has any authority that it extends over the um, Bible translation movement. So having clarified that, the, I think the real answer is in what FOBI does provide, and that is a point of contact between representatives of, of the FOBI member uh, organizations. So like in the translation development group, uh, part of FOBI, we have um, I think the most recent meeting had approximately 25 representatives from different agencies. Most of us are friends and know each other and communicate with each other in various ways outside of uh, FOBI. And these relationships are critical. These friendships are critical to good partnering and good uh, collaboration between our organizations in the, the Bible translation movement. And so um, I think one of the things that can help sometimes to uh, reduce tension between organizations or uh, potential tensions is when we really try to understand uh, the context of another organization. Earlier, Marlon uh, mentioned he comes from a different organizational um, setting. And I would ask, um, I don't know the list of participants um, in this webinar, but um, I assume many are from an SIL, um, um, are in SIL assignments. And my question would be, uh, how much time have you taken to truly understand how the United Bible Societies and the National Bible Societies work together? Sometimes we fall into stereotypes and almost caricatures of how other organizations work. And so one of the real benefits of the, the Forum of Bible Agencies is getting to know each other as friends, having relationships where we uh, learn more about how the various organizations work and we learn to respect those differences and realize that the best partnering can happen when we truly understand uh, those that we are partnering with. Excellent. Yes, Michelle, what are your thoughts on this? How can we 
hold these imbalances um, while trying to serve the best. If we're unable to level out power imbalances and differences between finances and approaches and everything, maybe that's not even desirable. How can we hold this tension or how, how should we conduct ourselves? Yeah, um, definitely these are, these are issues that we have to really live with as, as, uh, as organizations, as people uh, operating uh, within the Bible translation movement. Uh, because uh, these, you, you we're talking about here of tensions about we're talking about managing uh, realities that often may come into conflict. And uh, as we have even said here, and Marlon indicated that checking three translations, he made three different decisions, and so on. And this speaks into the wide variety of the of the processes and the procedures that various organizations that are part of FOBI get to use in, the, in, in, in doing Bible translation. <clears throat> and in such a context, even the forum on its own could be a place of tension if we choose to focus on the differences that we have among ourselves. But the forum has intentionally, as Brian has indicated, decided to say networking Building friendships is one of the key goals that we aim to achieve when we get together in the annual conferences or annual meetings and so on. That's one thing. But that said, the forum has also in the area realized that it, its strength and its ability to bring Bible translation among the key concerns of the mission movement comes from the fact that it acts somewhat as a, as a body that helps to to uphold some of the shared standards, some of the common denominators that we all have as a Bible translation movement. And this is something that goes all the way back to when the forum was created around 1990. It was coming out of the Manila 1989 meeting that John Bender Samuel and Fergus MacDonald realized that Bible translation was the lowest on the agenda of the mission movement. And they realized that we could not advocate for Bible translation by, by continuing to just operate in, in silos. That's why they thought of bringing the, the, the agencies together. So it's a place of networking, but it's also a place where we can build a platform for advocacy. And with the advocacy that has been done on Bible translation, we saw how the Cape Town 2010 meeting upheld Bible translation and took a commitment to the eradication of Bible, Bible poverty. So uh, the tension is there in terms of the diversity of the practices, but we also want to use the forum as, a, as an opportunity to build unity around the essentials that we all hold together. And around those is essentials, we have not only the agencies, but we have the investors we have, and that becomes a good place of a conversation that allows various people at least to understand the perspectives from which different organizations or different individuals approach issues. So that would be my, uh, what I could add to what Brian just said. Mm -hmm. Marlon? Uh, yes, I don't want to add much more. I, I, I think that my colleagues have said, uh, it, it's a very, the te tensions are always going to be with us. I think transparency is important. So it's important for me as a consultant to lay down on the table with my translators what my roles are, <laughs> the different roles that I need to take within the project, but my desire to be a servant. And every time again and again, I need to remind myself, but, but by laying my cards on the table, I'm helping them help me <laughs> to remind me what my role is. So they can call me to task too. So if, if I'm coming in with an exegetical choice and say, well, I think this is the way different choices, but I would recommend this. And a translator takes a translation handbook and says, I have looked at the translation handbook and I've come to different conclusions. As a consultant, I need, to, I need to give way. I need to, because I'm teaching this person to become their own independent thinker. So, mm -hmm. so that's why sometimes not all the choices are necessarily my choices. If they are defendable, if they are defendable exegetically, I should, as a consultant, I think be able to allow them or not even allow them. I mean, they, the, translators, the translators have the right. It's just when there are misunderstandings and when you know something is totally off base, 
then you go in dialogue with the trustees. So I think transparency is important. We need to discuss what it means to be stakeholders. We need to allow the translators to, to give them a voice. And, and, and something you, you said, um, Drew, was very important that the minute you sit at the table, judge your own who you are. <laughs> I mean, this is a very embodied work. <laughs> who you are sitting there at the table with a group of indigenous people, or people talking another language, you're using a vehicle language. You're using a language that often is not even your mother tongue, not their mother tongue. So all of these things come into play. You have your title, you come from an organization. So you need to work very consciously as a consultant to break down these barriers, very consciously so that the translators will see you as an equal who they can push back. And it's something that you have a responsibility, I think, as a consultant to constantly work at. How do I break down these barriers which the translators might have just in terms of different culture, organization, and all these kinds of stuff. So. No, I, I think that's wonderful. Gentlemen, I'm now going to ask you, is it time for us to shut down the whole missionary Bible translation enterprise? Given multilingualism, given language death, given urbanization, our past uh, mistakes, if you will, power imbalances, in increasing capacities of local to do the work, God complexes, tendency toward colonial attitudes. Tell me why, try to convince me why we should continue with this enterprise, with the Bible translation movement. Let's go to you first, Michelle. I, I like the fact that Michelle is going first on this one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think this is the strangest question you could ask us today, Drew, because um, uh, you, you say, is it time to shut down the enterprise of Bible translation? And I, I'm tempted to respond to you with another question. Did you, did you stop the enterprise of Bible translation? Did we wow. stop the enterprise of Bible translation? To me, this is, that is really the key. We tend to put ourselves really in the shoes of, of God himself. Is, it, is, is, Bible, is the enterprise of Bible translation a bright idea that, he, that people just had at some point in time? Or is Bible translation something that God himself is spearheading and doing because it is part of what his own strategy to, 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 to reveal himself to the peoples in their own context, in their own realities, wherever they find themselves? I think that is the deepest question that we should be asking ourselves. And if Bible translation is indeed God's own idea and God's own strategy to reveal himself to the people. If Bible translation is following the words of Andrew Walls, the, 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 the extension of the incarnation of Jesus Christ to the people to make Emmanuel become a reality to each person in their own given context, then I think the question of should we shut down this enterprise is really out of place. But in the meantime, I believe that it is important for us to, uh, to, to seek to, to do our best to say, how do we respond to some of the issues that we are learning from the history and from the challenges mm -hmm. that we encounter? It is important for us to do our best to figure out how to respond. Also knowing that others 50 years down the road will be here assessing and judging us on what we've done today. So that's, that's one thing. And so, so uh, what I would really want to say, just in maybe in, in a few words in response, to, in response to your question is, indeed, Bible translation, there are so many issues. There are power issues. There, were, there are accusations of colonialism. Uh, there are issues of the church growing in the global South and raising the question, do we need workers from other parts of the world going to the global south? There are so many questions. But one of the things that motivates me personally is to think about the kingdom for which we all are aiming. A kingdom of people from, from all nations, from all languages, from all tribes. A multicultural kingdom. So given the, the reality for which we are aiming, which is that multicultural kingdom, it seems to me that it makes sense for a multicultural group of people to be serving together towards that multicultural kingdom. And a multicultural king, pe group of people working together becomes a place of discipleship. It becomes a place of preparation 
for living the kingdom way. And that is why I believe that despite the challenges, God is still, because he is the missionary God, God is still calling his people from everywhere to be involved in his work anywhere. And we instead need to be embracing discipleship in ways that really allow us to be part of and participants in what God himself is doing. This is not an easy question. I said it from the outside view, but uh, that would be my perspective. Thank you. Thank you. I know it was a strange question, but it made you sit up in your chair, Michelle. And I and if it made you slightly angry, that was good. That's the reaction I was going for. It means you feel a certain conviction about what we're involved in. Brian, let's go to you. Is it time to shut it down? Why should we keep going? Well, I, I would have a similar reaction to what Michelle has expressed, um, that this is a, a very strange question. Um, but I would go back to uh, one of Michelle's um, three P's uh, from um, early in, in this discussion, and that is pragmatism. If it's only pragmatic um, interests that motivate us, yes, let's shut it down. Um, because I think with just pragmatic, uh, linguistic, anthropological, sociological reasoning for whatever has motivated different parts of the Bible translation enterprise, uh, we come up short when we're faced with ethical questions of Bible translation. And so like this whole question of the power dynamics Translation is itself a demonstration of power. Um, because, say, if we consider the discussion that's out there uh, generally about world literature, whose literature qualifies to be world literature? Well, it's usually not, um, to put it this way, many of the, the, it's not the literature that emerges from many of the places where we've been involved in different Bible translation projects. Uh, world literature is, um, is actually very uh, contested because it is so um, colonial and so prejudicial. And so um, choices to translate um, just the decision to translate scripture for a uh, uh, for community somewhere around the world is an ethical decision that involves power dynamics. Uh, because we're in a sense saying, or someone has is indicated that there's something missing that needs to be there. And that involves us in, in ethical questions. And this is why I think it's so important for us to be as grounded as we can in uh, the biblical, theological, and missiological understandings of Bible translation. As I think Michelle mentioned earlier, uh, that is that God is the one who initiated this process of, of translation because it's about the communication of his mighty deeds um, to the world uh, through translation. And so um, until, I don't think the Bible translation um, I don't think Bible translation as an activity should be closed, shut down. Perhaps some aspects of our institutional approaches to Bible translation need to be rethought. Um, but Bible translation should not be shut down until the knowledge of the glory of the Lord covers the earth as the waters fill the sea. Okay, Marlon, do you want to go to bat? 
Um, yeah, so I kind of rephrased the question to say, it's a time to shut down the way we as translation agencies have become partners in God's translation enterprise or in God's mission of incarnating the word because that will always continue that that's always part of what God is doing. It's just, I think the question probably is the way we have been engaging with it. We have become partners with God and as human beings, we can make decisions how we will partner. And we learn as time goes, um, as, as with anything. And, and, and shutting down in that sense might be, mean transforming and learning. And, and one of the most important things I think that we need to learn moving forward is this sense that, so, so there's this big question about the aim of translation. Is translation a goal in itself? Um, I sometimes try to translate translation is not a goal in itself. Translation is a medium. We're talking about scripture engagement. We're talking about the encounter with Jesus and encounter with God. So in that sense, when I see translation as a means that actually transform cultures, um, the translation enterprise as we have been involved with, with all its quirks and, and all its tensions, um, I think it has a legitimate place in the world because theologically, sociologically, just in terms of the way the world is, is, is going, because it's a statement. It's a statement about um, cooperation. It's a statement about God visibility. I think that Bible translation has made visible a lot of group people groups that were invisible. Um, Bible translation has made visible um, sometimes women in a particular context, um, certain minority groups in another context. So there's something about the visibility, making visible of human beings that I think Bible translation adds to the table. Um, when we talk about our agencies, how we, we have gone about this, and our emphasis now on training translators, our emphasis of, um, so sometimes I wonder why do we think that, so people say we have come to help you, and then we have come to help you, and now we are leaving you because you, we don't need to help you anymore. When am I going to get a chance to help you who came to help me? So, so, so if we are going in as translation agencies and missionaries went in, there is also a sense in which God uses people groups, new translations, new ways of traveling with the Bible to, to, to say something to the global church. So I, 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 I think in that, in that sense, what needs to be changed is we need to create more opportunities for us to hear the voices from the translation field. Um, the indigenization of theology, I would call it, where language is so important. So there's so much we all can learn. And I'm just mentioning a shout out to the TIPS, pro, the TIPS website. Where I'm one of the advisors for the TIPS, which is a, a, a website where um, translation stories are uploaded where you can hear the voices of communities that struggle with the word of God, get all the inf right information, but see things that we in the, let's say the Western traditional academia have not seen. So I, I think that, I think we need a paradigm shift. It's not just we helping them, <laughs> let me put it that way, <laughs> um, um, to get the word of God. It's also once we help people, when the word gets rooted, when Christianity becomes rooted in any culture, that culture is going to teach us something new, something fresh about, about, about Christianity and about the Bible. So, so I would say scripture engagement is very important. So that's why I don't see it so much as being shut down, as being transformed. And this, bi, this, 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 this unidirectional way of thinking, I think we need to be more bidirectional and I think in a sense, we need to allow for these voices to come up and to hear these voices. So that's what I think we need to, it's more to move a paradigm shift where, where we see it as benefiting all of us and not just one group benefiting the other. Yeah. Amen. No, what you gentlemen are describing sounds very beautiful and I'm glad to be a part of it. And I'm glad to hear that we're not shutting the whole thing down. But I suspect that there are some ideas that you hear repeated in the myriad of meetings that you are forced to assist. So Michelle, what is one idea at least in Bible translation, biblical studies or missions, in your opinion, that needs to go away? 
uh, I think uh, I would follow Brian here when he said, uh, when you ask for one thing, that's, that's generally tough um, to, to just say, this is the one thing that needs to go away. But really, I, I would say, um, the, I mean, the, I would speak more in terms of the approach and personal attitude, an attitude of approaching mission or approaching ministry or approaching Bible translation as a hero, as the hero who can sort it out for all of you guys out there. I think that's one attitude that needs to go away because it's really about a communal enterprise. It's about an effort that brings, the, that brings together the perspectives of all that God calls around the table. So that would be one idea that I would uh, encourage us, us all to, uh, to, to, to leave behind as we fed ahead. Thank you. Yeah, um, that's what I was referencing earlier when I used the term God complex. Um, this idea that I'm the savior, I'm going to fix everything, I'm the hero. Good. Yes, um, Brian, what's one idea in translation, Bible translation, biblical studies, mm -hmm. missions that needs to go away? I, I thought you might be asking me next. Um, I, I think, well, this is a tough question. Um, I think one thing would be the assumption that we really understand the world. Um, and because it's been such a tendency of those of us who um, grew up in, were trained in, have been exposed to, I'll use the unfortunate uh, term, the Western Academy, um, to think that we have somehow attained some kind of universal understanding of um, of the world and so one thing that I think needs to go away is that tendency to think that uh, we can attain some kind of universal whatever it is theory theology approach to translation and realize that there is such incredible richness in each of the places that God has created where he has gifted his people. And um, so uh, we need to adopt, as we said earlier, that role of learner and, um, and try to shed that tendency we have to think that we are, um, we know what how we know what others need. And uh, so I think we need a serious um, consideration of, of ethics and um, ethics applied to uh, Bible translation and as we move further into this 21st century. Thank you. Yeah, Marlon? Good, yes. Um... One idea that needs to go away. One idea that needs to go away. I, I think um, the idea, and I'm going to qualify it after I say it, the idea that the translation task can be over. Um, yes, what can be over is agencies, um, policies, planning, commitment to where, because donors have the right to, to say where they want to invest their money in the kingdom. That's a right a donor has. And a donor has to write to say, I'm investing in this and not in this because I cannot invest in everything in the kingdom. That, that's a right. Um, the thing is that it's more a pragmatic, a, a financial resource, scarcity of resources issue where we can say this is our goal as an, whatever agency or whatever donor group can say that because that, that's a right and it's good to be transparent. Totally applaud that. But I think we are making, we might, be, we might be making a big mistake if we start thinking about the translation task as being over because we have seen in the history of the world that this is not true. We see it with English translations, French translations, Latin translations, all history of Bible translation. It's not when you have one text means that everything is finished. And, 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 and concurrent 
coming a, a derivative of that misunderstanding sometimes. Um, theologically, there are some issues with it, but I think there are also some, some social linguistic and church problems with it. What I see in a lot of smaller communities that we are trying to assist in getting their first New Testament or their first portion or their whole Bible is that they want context of the Bible. It's not if there was ever a time, and it was always, I think, but nowadays especially, you go to any smaller communities and they get the New Testament, they say, I would like some notes with it. I, I would like some longer introductions with it. Because, there's, because the world has become a global village. And people, so many, much things are thrown at people that they want to be able to kind of root the Bible in their own reality and get more background information. So I think that's why I think the challenge is big. Because if we think only about getting every people group a New Testament, for example, and we don't think about the study Bible. I mean, the need for study Bibles in America's region where I work, I mean, many, many communities, one of the first things they tell you, even as they're working on their translation, not finished yet, is they say, when we finish this, are we going to get a study Bible? <laughs> because we want the study Bible in our own language. Because they realize that the study Bible gives you knowledge, gives you power, gives you the ability to interact with the text behind the text. So I, I would say that might be one misunderstanding, and I do understand it in terms of managerial, um, financial planning and all that, the respect for that, and we are very grateful to our donors who support the, this, this ministry, but I think there needs to be a dialogue between the translation field and, and donors and, and, and people in certain positions, so to understand what Brian was saying, to understand what's coming from the field. Um, people are not just only happy to have the Gospel of John. They would like to have the Gospel of John with some notes in it. They would like to have it with some introduction to help them understand the text. Yes, thank you. Um, well, we're going to move now into our uh, question and answer time. And the participants have submitted a number of questions here. Unfortunately, we're going to, we've got about 13 minutes left um, for our webinar. So we're going to try the best we can to um, answer some of the questions that have been submitted here. There's a question here from Marlon, um, from my friend Nathan Michael. Um, he says that you talked about meeting the needs or filling in the gaps of a team's, of a team's ability, abilities. Um, figuring out what their strengths and weaknesses are, how do you go about um, figuring out what those holes are? Practically speaking, how can a consultant assess or figure out where those weaknesses, holes are that need to build? Very, very good question. Very short answer is, it, first thing, it takes time. It's a process. The second thing is a con constant evaluation that you're making. Sometimes you start working with the team and you realize they are very good, very adept at analyzing their own language. Not only do they speak the language well, but they can discuss, they have a meta language about the language. Sometimes you start working with the team and you realize they, they don't have a meta language. They have never really linguistically analyzed their own language. So then you, you cannot help them with that, but you try to find resources, people in the community, linguists that have come in, people who know the language and have analyzed it to help them think about it. Sometimes you see there's a lack of biblical background so then you, you give more, more um, teaching about the biblical background. So our paratext te a, a technology, some teams pick up paratext very quickly. Some teams struggle <laughs> for many years <laughs> to pick up all uh, different features that they need. So I think it's a process, but it has to be, I think, one of the primary things at the, on the mind of the consultant. Every visit and in, in planning the year out, the consultant needs to ask, what do I need, what, what have, do I have to offer this team? And, and of course they're offering to us all the time, but what, what do I have to offer? What do they need? And maybe I'm not the person that can give it to them. I can bring another consultant, for example, with more expert, that's an expertise in that area, or locally I can find resources, but it, at least the question should be there. But it's a process. It's a process of observation, back and forth. The more comfortable the team feels with the consultant, the more they will, um, let down their hair, the more they will show their, their weaknesses. So it's a process. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Next question here comes from Sama Hana, who says, uh, Michelle, how do we define professionalism, professionalism 
in Bible translation. Is this incompatible with mission, a calling to mission? Um, I hope I've captured the, the essence of the question here. But um, how do we define professionalism in Bible translation? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. And I certainly was uh, provocative when I mentioned professionalization before. But you may have noticed that I, prefix, I prefixed it with an adjective, extreme professionalization, uh, which is uh, what I'm, I was actually referring to. And in talking about it, I was coming from some of my own experience uh, in Africa, where for a number of years I was involved in uh, translation degree programs where uh, people were being trained to become translators who could be exegetes, translation consultants, and so on. And one thing that we noticed was that people, translators always had a, a question, an issue of identity, identity within the church, identity within society, identity because being a translator was like a category what that was so professionalized that it always only made sense in the context of a bible agency and so the, the extreme professionalization i'm talking about is not a, a, a denial or a, i'm not saying that we throw away the research and the ongoing learning path that is involved in the translator's work but I'm talking here of really making, making translation a more of a missional thing that is fully integrated in the church so that we can, the translator can more and more be likened to the reformers, to, to, the, to, the, to the reformers who were not just translators, scholars and so on, but they were also teachers. They were also people who shaped the ongoing life of the church. That's what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm talking about the danger of extreme professionalization, which is which definitely cuts off the translator from within the community into some kind of mm. mysterious category. Mm. Okay, good. Um, there's an anonymous question here. I, I hope we can ask it to you, Brian. Um, somebody's interested in knowing where there are projects being facilitated that start as an oral project and then move into written. Are you familiar with where that is happening or what entities are involved in such projects? I know that uh, those kinds of projects are, um, do exist and some would be, I've, I'm sure under the auspices of SIL and others with uh, Seed Company. I don't um, at my fingertips have the exact locations of where those projects are happening. But uh, if someone would like to follow up on that, I could, I could uh, refer them to uh, the uh, colleagues in either SIL or Seed Company who would have that uh, more specific information. Um, and I think just one comment about that whole area is, is really what the conversations I've been involved in is we're really trying to look at translation from a multimodal or multimedia point of view, that it's not about uh, one uh, being oral or print, or not that that was necessarily implied in this um, uh, question, or that it's just oral to print um, what are the needs of the community? What are the desires of the, of the church in the community? And we need to adapt our strategies to, um, to fit the, uh, the, what is being expressed by the local community. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, if I could just add the, um, uh, the, the, the commitment of our organizations, and I can speak about SIL, is that even when we start with an oral translation, it's really about the context. It's about responding to the reality and the need of the context, taking into account the situation of the language and so on. But it's not a, a, a close decision that because it started with oral, the written translation cannot, cannot follow. I, I remember a region that I personally visited in, the, in, the, in PNG, the CIPIC area, where the strategy is to consistently start with oral translations, but continuously evaluate the, 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 the vitality of the language and the needs of the church in order to determine whether to move to a 
written translate to, to, to a print translation. So that's, that's what I could add to Brian's response. Okay, very good. And um, we'll entertain one final question here that comes from uh, Martin Engeler. And it appears that he has read your um, Phobi paper, Michelle, on who needs scripture. Um, there where you talk about there being three different generational audiences that we need to consider when doing Bible translation. And the question he's asking is, how does this impact um, statistics for expressed or potential Bible translation needs? We have progress.bible that gives us regular snapshots, and we have these different categories for where translation needs are. But how does the way you're looking at it impact our statistics? Uh, I think, um, Martin, thank you for that question. It's a very, very uh, good question that you're asking. And actually, uh, my paper presented to four by, and which is now published by the International Bulletin of Mission Research, uh, is out there. And my desire through that paper is just, is to provoke uh, the Bible translation movement. I want to challenge us to think. I want to uh, provoke us. And I know that our current categories of defining the translation needs do not reflect, does not reflect what I'm talking about in that paper. And so uh, I think the more we engage with those ideas, with those concepts, and the more we really take the context and the realities of the communities and churches seriously, definitely we're going to come to the place of saying, so what? And how do we understand the needs? How do we define the needs in ways that truly reflect what we understand the communities to need? And I know that our current understanding and definition of the need is pretty much premised on the fact that Bible translation aims at comprehension of the scripture in order to allow evangelism. But today, there is more than that. In a number of contexts, multilingualism has grown and people speak more than their mother tongue and can achieve comprehension of the scripture uh, outside of their mother tongue. And often the church has preceded Bible translation in a number of contexts where uh, the church is already doing ministry using probably a foreign language. And in those with those realities, we have to rethink what is the function of Bible translation. And from my experience, Bible translation is indeed needed. But in a number of cases, it would not serve the primary purpose of comprehension and evangelism, but it would serve the purpose of deepening the, the, the growth of the church, deepening discipleship. It will serve the purpose of theological formation. It will serve the purpose of even affirming the identity and allowing the cultural transformation, which Marlon mentioned before, and that cultural transformation is essential in order to allow the sustainability of the Christian or the, the Christian of the Christian impact within the community. So these are some of the things that I would like us to be thinking about in the 21st century when we think of Bible translation. Yes, thank you. That's all the time we have for our question and answer, and we're going to wrap up our webinar now. Are there any final thoughts from any of the panelists? No, I just want to thank you, Drew, for I think you did a very good job in throwing a lot of uh, fastballs uh, and, and curveballs. <laughs> very good discussion, and also a lot of respect, and enjoyed uh, being part with uh, Michelle and with Brian. I think it was a good interaction. Thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this. Yeah. You're welcome. Yes, I'll also say thank you. Uh, it was, I was looking forward to this time to have this conversation with these good friends. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this. Yeah, thank you very much. When one gets the opportunity to speak last like me, you just have to say amen. Uh, but uh, really, it's been a pleasure to reconnect with Marlon. We met at the last Bible yes, yes. conference where we both were speaking. It was yes, really a pleasure. Yes. And it's so good to reconnect with Brian, although through this means. But uh, really, thank you very much, Drew, for the initiative. No, you're welcome. And the very last thing we want to do here is uh, my colleague, Harry, we just want to pray a word of blessing over the three of you. We are so grateful for your leadership, for... Um, 
for your examples and you taking the time to participate in this webinar today. Lots of good food for thought. So we just want to pray to the Lord to ask that he would continue to bless your ministries and watch over you and keep you. So go ahead, Harry. Let's, let's bless these gentlemen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you've made clear that Bible translation is a work that you started. We thank you that you've given us a part in this, that uh, we can be a part of your work. And we just, we feel honored that we have a part in it. Thank you for Marlon and Michelle and Brian and for work they've had in your work of Bible translation as they lead groups and peoples. Thank you for the times that they've spent, for the um, travel that they've made, not during this COVID time, but in the past and in the future, the travel they'll be doing. Thank you, ask your protection on them and their families. Thank you for all the people who tuned in. We thank you that for most of the folks, the technology worked. You're the God who created everything, and we owe all this to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, gentlemen. Um, the recording will be available probably in the next week or so, so watch out for that link. If anybody heard anything they would like to follow up on or um, any questions or would like any more information, feel free to write to me. If you're not be currently being notified of our webinars, you can write to me as well, and I'll, I'll put you on the list to be notified of future webinars. We've got an excellent one on the Arabic Bible coming up in October with our um, with an excellent, excellent scholar of kindred spirit, Dr. Um, Samahena, who's going to lead us through paratextuality and the Arabic Bible. It's going to be fascinating. You don't want to miss it in October. Watch out for the notice. Blessings to you, brothers. Thank you so much for taking the time out to, um, to do this, and uh, have a good rest of the day. You too. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. God bless you.